Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. I had the honor of bringing in someone from a completely different part of the world. We actually met out in Malaysia. He has a phenomenal, huge church out there, big influence. And in this episode, we really dive into how did he, one, become a pastor, two, he has multiple successful style businesses between him and his wife, leading a great family. He's had phenomenal mentors. How did he get them? How did he keep them through each season of his life? And how has he managed his passions and his responsibilities? And what does God say about your passions? Are you able to have fun with the business that you're creating? Or are you supposed to neglect the fun to focus on the mission that's at hand? Please welcome a great friend of mine, Pastor Kevin Liu. So we have not met on American soil yet, Pastor Kevin. We actually met on Malaysian soil. Now we're meeting, it, uh, it's 8 a.m. here, 9 p.m. where you're at, uh, but grateful to have you on God's business and so cool that you know we didn't meet in the U.S. and then you went home, which is the majority of the relationships I have. I had the honor to go over to your church collective in KL in Malaysia as well as you made American food or Western food. I, I guess we don't talk about Western food. There is no, in America, you can't go, where do we get Western food? There, <laughs> That's right. Because you're already here. Um, yes. But I had the honor of, of eating the food that you cooked and prepared for us at your house. And I'm grateful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so looking forward to, yeah, this time together. Yeah. Just from a, a close perspective, it's awesome to see you guys have one, a thriving church. I live in Texas. So if you open up a church, there's already going to be lots of people that are just looking for one. Uh -huh. <laughs> there's plenty of them on every single corner. Maybe there'd be so many churches is what people would maybe complain about. But we're in a Christian country. Like I live in a place where pretty much everyone's growing up with Christian values as e even if they don't believe in God, they just naturally kind of get that. You guys have built this amazing place uh, in in Malaysia. Yep. And just the way that you guys have done it is so cool. I, I When I went out there, the excellence, I learned different things that I told our church to do. We're building a new building and I was looking and picking up little things that you were doing amazing. And, and then I saw the just the differences, you know, just uh -huh. different cultures. For me, what's so interesting to me is someone who's so talented. I, I wear your shoes for people that don't know, like he created his own shoes <laughs> and I, I wear them now. I really enjoy them. They're just so simple and I can kind of wear them with anything and they don't, they're not very, un they're not uncomfortable, but they mm -hmm. don't look like a workout shoe that I wouldn't be able to wear places. So I've, I've really enjoyed it. I took pictures. I did a photo shoot. I don't know if you saw, but your art piece was behind one of our photos. I'll have to send it to you. It might be yes, like a magazine. That's the magazine photo right there. Like the happy family with your art piece behind it. Yet at the same time, making such a big impact. I'm very interested to hear what was your journey of ending up planting your roots so deep in where you're at because you're committed now it's very like you've sowed seeds and really put roots where you're at uh -huh. what was your journey leading up to that how did you get there right um well thank you once again for having me in this interview uh, i live in kuala lumpur right now which is the main city of malaysia but i grew up in a very small town uh in sabah sabah is another state like Texas is a state, so Sabah is another state. That's where I grew up as a teenager, and that's where I encountered God. And it was very interesting that after I finished my high school, uh, while waiting for my school results, <clears throat> I ended up working in church one day. It is really quite accidental. I just turned up, and then the, the, the pastor asked me, why are you here? I just say, maybe I want to work in the church. So he took me in and it was meant to be a three months uh, stint. I would just help out in the church for three months. It went on for six months and I really enjoyed it. It went on for a year. And after that, uh, I was with that church working, serving, pioneering different churches. Uh, I ended up being there for 10 years. So it was during wow. that... Yeah, it was during that 10 years that a lot of my spiritual formation took place. The pastor that I was with, uh, he was a very smart and intelligent man. He taught me many, many things 
from the very practical things of how to build a physical church building to building the spirituality of the congregation. And I think I, I did not just learn stuff from him, but I saw how he lived. I saw his passion for God's people. I saw his passion for the house of God. And I think a lot of that was rubbed on me after 10 years. So when I had the privilege to build our church and to plant a church in the city, I basically just did everything he taught me. What What's your thought on this? In, in the business world, a lot of times they talk about don't get to know your heroes. This is very common. And if you look uh, at maybe Hollywood or even influencers, one of the ways they keep their excitement is by being hidden, right? They, they don't show yeah. themselves to the, and a pastor has to do kind of the opposite, a good pastor and, tr- and a by definition pastor. And again, you're the pastor. I'm not. So you, you correct me at any point. Yet you, you don't hide and try to keep a mysteriousness about you to keep the congregation there. But it's very common in those areas. And usually when you get to know someone, you find <laughs> that they're one way in the congregation and then a different way at home. And that's why they say, don't get to know your heroes because you'll realize that they just have faults. Maybe your friend or your, your mentor, maybe you saw that they had weaknesses and maybe you just had a different way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. One, I would love for you to speak on that. But also, what were the things that that mentor did that were so impactful by the way that they lived? What was the, like, what did they do? Was it a routine? Was it, was it their discipline? What was so attractive to you as someone who is looking to learn and grow to submit yourself for 10 years and feel that that was, that was worth it? Yeah, I think, I think firstly, I was uh, lucky or blessed, if you like, because I was very young when I started uh, following him. So, and I, the way I saw him was he was very consistent in public and in private. And he was Mm. constantly like teaching, whether it was me in his home or his children or his wife or when he was in church. So, and then I look at how he organized his home and I look at how he organized the church. I just thought like, wow, I never had this in my own home. So I really wanted to emulate that. And his wife was uh, uh, an amazing lady in herself, right? She, when I first got to know them and I started going to their house and then I was a teenager, right? And the wife just gave me a book and say, Kevin, you are growing up, read this book. And the book is called, I Marry You. So, so it just taught me all the values about Christian marriage, Christian relationship and how to deal with you know, uh, a, a, a relationship. So I just thought that I really wanted to have that kind of uh, family. So because of that, um, I didn't think that much about the mystery, uh, whether it was his weakness or his fault. I just thought it came in a package. That's so interesting. And for your family, you said that you encountered God when you were a teenager. What was the condition of your family? What were their beliefs? Were you the first one to believe that way? Did they lead you there? And what was that relationship like afterwards and played out now over however many years? You, you know, you're, I know you're only 21, but uh, <laughs> for the audio people, they're going to think that that's actually true. <laughs> but for no. if you're watching the video, you'll, he still looks like he's maybe 31. So, <laughs> uh, Thank you. Um, okay. My mom was not a Christian when I came to faith. My dad is a Christian. Uh, he passed away now. Uh, but my dad was the most interesting Christian you ever meet. He never forced me to church. In fact, he told me that don't go to church unless you want to. So, so I was the one wow. who was actively going to church. And as a result of that, and there, there were a lot of tension at home because I was working in church, spending so much time there. And, you know, I didn't earn a lot of money back then. So my mom was paranoid, like, is he ever going to make it in life? So, but over the years, and uh, after all that I've been through, the church that I've planted, the many lives that I was able to touch, mom was really happy. In fact, she gave her heart to Jesus not too long ago. So that's uh, wow. that was really something that, you know, I, I was really praying for for many years. So good. And, and tell me where Esther came in. I got to meet your wife and your family. My son, I have a picture in a very American picture in your home where my son has a n- fake knife and a little toy gun. And he looks like he's so hardcore 
but they're obviously a little fake toys. And I, and, and so he got to have a lot of fun with, with your kids and they did so well with him. Where did that relationship, like, where did that collide? Cause what I'm recognizing is that you could live anywhere. You have lots of talents. You could have gone down many career choices, mm-hmm. but even with all of that, you've ended up where you're at. And I think for a lot of people, that is a very interesting thing. How do you end up where you're at? Well, how did you get planted there? How did you meet your wife? So we'll start with your wife first. How did you guys end up meeting? Was it inside of that church? Was it later? Was it travel? Okay. So, so, so we, we came from Saba. So Esther and I were in the same church. So in that oh, wow, cool. one year, I started out like I was helping the pastor. I was doing whatever that he wanted me to do. It went on to become a second year, third year, fourth year. At some point, I started speaking to the youth. And I also started leading worship. And well, uh, Esther was the pianist and I was the worship leader. So, and initially it was Esther's brother who was my friend. And then I got to know Esther. And from there, it, we kind of like built a friendship. But we never got started until many years later. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe it's time to settle down at some point and look for someone that I want to be serious with. And I remember the book the pastor's wife gave me. So I went home. I saw Esther again. And I, you know, it was interesting. So I said, uh, are you okay? If one day you're going to marry a pastor. So she said, why not? And I get, I guess that's how we both got started not too long after that. So we grew up together, grew up in church, grew up serving. And I get, and I, I, Nicholas actually, um, I don't think I had a lot of gifts. I don't think that I was very talented when I was younger and I always not very, I was always not very confident. So, and I think the biggest change that happened in my life was when I was being mentored by my pastor at that point of time that so many of my perspective, the way I view the world, the way I view church, the things that I want to do and his passion of wanting to teach the word, that that was the thing. Those were the things that really shaped me and uh, to give me the confidence that uh, I could do what I'm doing today. So I, I have to credit the bulk of my life in the early formation years, uh, they're all attributed to him. So I guess that's why I became so rooted in uh, what I'm doing right now. What a great example as well of the people talk about here, a lot of nature versus nurture. Uh You have who you are and you can't change it. And and there's some things to that, even especially if you're going to play basketball, being taller definitely helps. And it's, and it's a little bit difficult to try to stretch yourself to be taller in, in the learning process mm-hmm. yet for you and, and me as well. And, and also one of our mutual friends paying June, he wasn't, he was pretty shy, wasn't very good at communicating. You're talking about for you, your skills were just undeveloped. You had a capacity to gain a skill set as you've done mm-hmm. with a lot of things. Now you've, you've had, you had the ability to get better yet. You weren't. And, and same with me. I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't have anything. No one thought that I was going to do well because I had nothing that would, help you do well that had Uh been crafted or formulated yet. Yet you talked about that underneath this mentor you gained. If someone goes to your guys' church or sees your content, no one would think that you're afraid or or lack the confidence to do something because you speak without authority. What a great picture of true mentorship. Now people hire people for a consulting one day, one week. But when you actually get to sit underneath someone, you get to like get a transference a little yes. bit of of who they are. Is there a way that you continued to do that over the years? I know that you guys have in, in a business sense from what I've seen. And I love that, that you guys continually are learning even as a couple with the different enterprises and things that you guys are doing. It's very cool. Yet, how have you continued to develop that? Because at first, you kind of fell into your mentor. You yeah. served there. You stayed there for 10 years. And then you can't really, for the rest of your life, just wait for the perfect mentor to come into your life again. Sometimes it takes who who has it now and who do I want to be around and choosing it. How have you continued to be around people that elevate you past that first experience? That that's uh, that's a very interesting question. Well, uh, I think I think uh, the pastor passed away quite some years back. And there was that season that I was really lost. And, oh, he's gone now. 
what am I going to do, right? Uh, then there was one day I actually watched a talk by Erwin McManus. And I think because I, I have to tell you that 45 minutes transformed my life so much in the way he spoke, wow. in the way he delivered the talk that I actually... And it resonated with what I believe was going to be the next season of my life. And I recognized that because of the words that he used, the way he carried himself. And basically, all that I believed that my future ought to look like was found in this person. And I only watched him on the video, okay? I wasn't there live, uh, but I have never done a pursuing in that manner in my whole life. I investigated after that. I went and checked all the places he has gone uh, speaking before, whether it was in Europe, in, in Asia, in America, in order to find someone who might know him that I know. And I found a friend who invited him to their church. And I wrote an email and I said, Sir, uh, that 45 minutes, you have no idea how much it has changed my life. If I have can have the privilege and invite you to Malaysia. That would be my life's greatest honor. So I, I sent the email, right? Nicholas, you know, you know how it goes. Like, uh, I don't think he'll reply to me. I don't, you know, I'm just going to try. And, and then you kind of like regret writing an email. And I did that. Uh, the most shocking thing was he replied. That was the first shocking thing. And second, he said, you know what? I don't want to just speak for you. Why don't we build a relationship first and see how it goes. And he said, why don't you come to America and just hang out, get to know each other. And then we see how it goes from there. I have never uh, received an email like that from, you know, technically still a stranger at that point of time, but it felt safe, Nicholas. It felt right. It felt like that would be something I would do for another person. So I, yep, I went all the way to America and spent time with him. And well, the rest was history. It was seven years ago. Um, I've built a really great relationship with him. I learned so much from him. I look up to him. I respect him. And, and, so, and so I guess at, at a certain point in our lives, you know, and you know deep inside, this is who I want to be. And this is the person that will help me. And I didn't care about cost. I didn't care about anything. I just canceled everything on my calendar, flew to LA to just meet him. That, that, that was what I did. And I think on a practical step, that's what it takes for people that are thinking, well, what's the practical way I can get there? Well, first is, is knowing that is your money or is that relationship more important? Because uh -huh. there's always an exchange of time and money and a percentage of it. M mm -hmm. Money oftentimes can shorten it because obviously if you walked there, it would have been cheaper. You would have had a lot of swimming, a lot of swimming going on, but it would have been cheaper to get out there. And then mm -hmm. there's the quicker way, which is, you know, if you were to even bring him out to your church, your church would have had to invest to the flights and the food and the stay. And, and there's always that yep. exchange, but also just that I'm willing to cancel, be inconvenient. <laughs> I still try to practice this today. I fly out to Las Vegas tomorrow and I don't even know if the trip's going to go the way that it's supposed to, but uh -huh. because there's a chance I'm, I'm going to go. And so I think That's it's right. just a great perspective for people to look at is, will you book the flight? Cause you could have gone out there and he could have just maybe talked to you for 15 minutes and you flew all the way out to LA and you never even got to talk to him. These had mm -hmm. to have been fears or, you know, whatever word would be best thoughts going through your mind going, if I fly all the way out there, what if he doesn't like me? And then I flew all the way out here and I canceled everything and nothing comes of this. It only is a good story because of your relationship over seven years. But yeah. there was a chance that none of that would happen. And many people have opportunities come their way based on what they're praying or asking for. And then they allow those voices to go, well, I can't go all the way out to America. I uh -huh. can't fly all the way out to Malaysia. Uh -huh. And then they listen to a show like this and wonder, why, why don't I have a great mentor like that? Well, have you taken that extra step out and, and gone out that way? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, Nicholas, it's, Chinese. It's, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Go on. Yeah. Sorry. I, I no, no, no. Please. Chinese. Okay. No, there, there's a Chinese saying that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And 
I honestly did not think of all the consequences of maybe he did, would not talk to me or whatever. I guess there are certain times in life the ROI is uncertain. The only thing that you're sure of is just be there. If you get nothing out of it, that's because you've been there and that's enough. And I think I, I don't do that often. In fact, I don't think I've done it more than five times in my life. But at that point, it just felt that it was right. Uh, we didn't talk for more than 50 minutes. I think we only talked for like five minutes, but it was enough. It was enough. Wow. And, and I was I was way more than happy. Wow. And on a funny and light note, what's the biggest differences between the U.S. and Malaysia or surrounding places that, that you go to often? I know that you've been to Australia as well, probably uh, more similar in some ways. Whereas what, what is the biggest differences? Confidence. I think, I think for wow. us Asian, we may know a lot of things, but we do not have the confidence. As a result, we're not able to articulate the thoughts, the ideas that we have on the inside. I, I speak in America quite a fair bit, and I realize in America, the ability, even for the youngest people, the ability for them to express their thoughts, uh, they're so confident, they're so articulate. And I just sometimes imagine, right, wow, it took me 20 years to get here to be able to speak like this. They wow. probably just watch three YouTube videos and they could produce, you know, similar uh, results. And I think, and I think a lot has got to do with the education, the upbringing, the exposure. Asians are just have the tendency to be more reserved and always think that, you know what, whatever I know, it's not important. Nobody cares. And, and I think that's the biggest difference between where I am and where you guys are. Yeah. What, where do you think that that, I know you talked about education, but what do you think is the way to bridge that gap? Because there's, there's got to be things that that's not so good for in America, maybe taking that too far where people think they're maybe too far ahead of where they're actually at. And maybe mm -hmm. in Asia, like you're talking about, there's people that are so equipped, but just feel like it's what they say isn't important or, or they're not ready. What, what's either the solution to it or what do you think is really the, that core reason that it's that way? I think, I think the, the most critical thing is education. Um, we are taught and told to listen in class. So you are not allowed to ask a lot of questions. Uh, or if you, if you ask the wrong question, you know, it's, it's, it all comes from Asia. Like that's a stupid question, right? And, and because of that, there's a lot of fear. <clears throat> and one of the things that I do when I do my training is to really set the tone and the pace for people to actually have the courage to ask questions. And, and you, you, can't, you can't tell them, all right, now is the time for you to ask a question. So ask the question. No. And I think by helping people in engaging them in a conversation. So, so instead of me saying, all right, now is your turn to ask a question, I will just engage them. I will talk to them and allow them to open up their thoughts, their, their opinions and bring it forward. By doing that, I hope that it will just seamlessly create a platform where uh, being able to articulate their thoughts are very important because a lot of times we are very afraid to be shut down, to be shut off by the teacher or the coach or the mentor. Like, no, nope, that's wrong. Try again. No, that's not right. Try again. And I think Ping would 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 agree, you know, in, in so many of our growing up developing journey, you know, that's right. That's not right. You know, don't do that. So so we we we're not trying to say something wrong. We we just still processing what we want to say, but very often it's in the processing that we've been shut down. So we end up like, you know what? Doesn't matter. Uh I don't think it's important after all. So so wow. over time and over generations it just becomes a habit for a lot of people. I forget what the analogy was, but there were, I think it was the, they put a bunch of monkeys in a room where every time monkeys would go for a banana, I think they would spray them with a hose. Uh -huh. And then even when they removed it, all the, the new monkeys would think about going for it and all the other ones would tear them down. No, 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 don't do it to the point where no one ended up going for it anymore. It's almost similar to when the 
the elephant, they tie the foot of the elephant and they hit yeah. the end and then you take it off and the elephant never leaves that, yes. that area. It takes that, that breaking through and, and for you, like you had it happen with even a mentor. So we know it can happen quick. The people that I got to meet when I was in Malaysia definitely didn't seem to struggle with it anymore, but I got to meet the people that were just doing very, very big things. And so it makes sense why they're doing these big things. It takes that ability to communicate with confidence. There's an yeah. old quote that says, if you say something enough times with enough confidence, it'll soon become truth. Mm -hmm. Because if you just, if you speak a message enough and people hear it enough, at some point, they're just going to accept it. Yeah. At, whether it's, and, and then it's up to us to make sure that it's actually a good and accurate statement. I, I had a big question for you though. Being right. multi-talented, uh, this is very difficult for me. I, I'm very passionate. And so sometimes my passions in the past could get in the way of my calling, I thought. Mm. And now I'm kind of in a place where I think that some of those passions and hobbies can be used alongside and, and are there for a reason. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of afraid in a way because when I was unsuccessful, I allowed these passions to get in the way of my calling or my responsibilities. For uh -huh. you, you have design and you have you have, from the physical like let's say your shoes to your art to your church you talked about how you led worship that's like another thing that is a talent that can give opportunity you have all these opportunities all these skill sets built now how do you not neglect those but put them in the right spot and make sure that your responsibilities get done do you have any any phase or any parts of life where you've either gotten distracted by by those hobbies or where those hobbies have maybe helped you inside of your what would be considered responsibilities or calling? What's important? <laughs> I think I think you are a master in asking questions, and and some of these questions are just so amazing. Uh, uh, things that I think about sometimes, but I don't know how to put them in words for people. Um, now, when I was growing up, I've always been someone that it's you know I like to do many things at the same time, and it you know but. When you're younger and none of this is showing any results at all, uh, you are then considered, you know, someone that just, it, you know, you're just, it, it's just a fad, you know, it just lasts for a while and then it's gone and then it's something else. But recently, I, I just recently, like two years back, I, I did, I, I joined a training called Berkman. It's from America. They, they are two types of people. One type are the restlessness whereby their restlessness level is very high and some restlessness level is very low. And just different type of people. Some people will try to do one thing and finish it before they start another. For me, I get very restless if I just do one thing. I rather, I have four projects running at the same time and it gives me a lot more space to imagine, to craft, to find a solution and to move things forward. And I realized that that's not actually a weakness, but it's just how I'm being wired naturally by God. So, so, and interesting that you asked this question because I subdued all this in the first part of my life, the first maybe 20 years of my life, I just did church because that's my calling and I should not be distracted. I shouldn't do this and that. You know, that's what you are called to do. You're the pastor. You do what the pastor should do. You preach, you counsel people, you talk to people and that's it, right? But about uh, in 2014, I was on the plane and I wanted to raise money for our church. And um, at that point, I had an idea to paint a large painting whereby everyone is a part of the big picture. That was the theme. So I painted this painting that is about 40 meters long and then I cut them into pieces. So uh, we had about 1,500 in the church. So I cut them into 1,500 pieces and then I framed them up and I gave every one of our church member a piece of the painting and I told them, every one of you is a part of a big picture, right? And so it was our fundraising campaign. So everyone gave, you know, they get a frame. They'll always remember this was what they did for the house of God, right? <clears throat> so it was at that time that I began thinking, could it be that painting is wrong in my life when it was God who allowed me to develop this ability when I was younger, but I never used it. <clears throat> and, uh, and that was when I began to understand and believe that the call of God in our lives 
is actually progressive instead of being static. So as you grow, you will develop more and you'll be able to do more. And, and it doesn't culminate to one part, one stationary moment of your life. It, so that it doesn't feel like, oh, all that I have been doing leads me to where I am now. Because if that's what we think, then what if five years down the road in a new milestone, you're doing something else, you will think that whatever you have done now is a waste of time, right? But it is not true. The call of God is progressive. So at this point of time, Nicholas, you and I, we are doing exactly what God wants us to do if we are doing it for the purpose of God. And I think that's important because five years down the road, you and I probably are going to be doing something else or maybe doing the same thing. It doesn't matter. But the point is that I began to realize that I'm actually a creative. The way I have planted the church, built the church, trained my leaders, that's who I am. I I, I can't change that. I That's me and I should be happy. I'm someone that's very restless. I do four or five things at the same time. I'm going to have my first solo exhibition in end of this year that I held back for very long because I always felt that it was wrong as a pastor that I have an art exhibition. My art is spiritual. You know, my life is spiritual. All that I do is spiritual. So yeah, I'm taking a step of courage forward. I, I was, while you were talking, it made me think about when we go through the Bible and most people don't read the Bible that much. I really, a lot of conclusions that I've come to doing this show or being on other people's show is people hear of the Bible or they read it a few times and they just take whatever lens they have on life and they put it on those few things that they've read. And I'm just putting a blanket over that. You know, for myself, I've struggled always to be consistent. I've been inspired by other people to be more consistent in reading the Bible. So just to pref- put that out there, I don't. I, I just think that no matter how much people tell me they read the Bible, the majority of the time I go, oh, when did you start? La- last week or the week before that? Because it's a thing, you know, for most people, it's not as consistent as we think. And I know that because my intention is to be consistent and I still yeah. have times where I'm less consistent than I want to be. And inside of it though, it looks like it's very fast. You know, it's like Jesus was this old and then he's this old. And we yeah. kind of miss this period in between or or the disciples walk from this place to this city and without the context of how long that was and how unproductive in, in the especially in the US with being a business owner, these 10, 15 minutes of unproductive time makes you go crazy. So the thought of preparing a canvas to paint just would seem like the most unproductive. We'd have to make sure we need to hire someone to prepare the canvas prior so that when we get there, it's ready to get. And the whole process, which part of it maybe can give you that creativity. It just made me think about how how often are we not really looking at, well, what did Jesus or the disciples, what did they do maybe for fun or that would be considered fun? I have a hard time even telling someone, my family, my son will go, Nick, dad, why are you doing this? <laughs> and I go, well, for fun, but I don't think that that's a good enough answer to do something. No, what's the real reason? Because I can't just do something for fun. Like, it, it, can I actually do that? And I think mm. that that's just my own personal issue. But I really struggle with doing something for enjoyment or what would be, I would have to tell my son, do it for fun. I feel like it has to impact others, move the needle, progress towards something. Mm-hmm. And if it's just for fun, it's a complete waste of time. G- give me some help. <laughs> I, I think, I think, I think we have to understand why fun is even a part of our lives in the first place. Um, is it possible that all of us will just do something for a purpose to impact lives, to change our world, to green the planet, and and all that, right? But but fun is actually a change of pace in the things that we do. It's a change of momentum. And um, when we understand that, fun becomes a space for recovery. You know, the word recreation comes from the word create. The etymology of the word is from the word create, which gives the word recreate. So if we just dissect that whole word recreation, is recreation. And every time... When you and I choose to have a recreation, it is to recreate something on the inside of us to recover, to replenish, to refresh, to renew, and to move forward. So then when we understand that, oh, actually fun, it's 
a changing of pace so that I can move forward. Um, and I think fun becomes very, very powerful. Um, I like to use this when I coach people, Nicholas. I say sometimes you have to take a step back to shoot a three pointer, and but but you just have to step out, you know. And re- the retreat is not going backward for because you have nowhere else to go, but the retreat is going backward in order to take a three point. I, I think that's important when we understand so that. And you t- you- You've mentioned a few times that the people that you coach or the people that you work with, if you could briefly go over so that other people know the different things that you do. And then I would love for you to touch on that coaching piece. What are some of the core things that that you work with people on that you see that you add value to? After obviously, you have quite a few things more than most people that you at least do. And that's just, again, you're, you're very talented. I do not know how to sing. I don't know how to dance. I don't know how to paint. I know that I could learn them, but where I'm at right now is not at a place where those things are fun because uh-huh. there's nothing to do because I've, I, I, I don't create it. So on your side, t- tell everyone what your, what your hands are in right now. And then I would love for you to touch on that coaching piece. Yeah. Uh, okay. So first and foremost, the most important thing that I do is that I pastor the church that I, I started uh, 22 years ago. So that would be my number one main focus. But I realized over time, I've developed such a strong and established team. Um, I don't have to do a lot of those things anymore. Uh, my team, I, in fact, when I say I don't have to, it's because they are way better than me. You know, I have people who are more talented in singing, in playing the music instruments. And I thought, hey, maybe, you know what? I should let them flourish in that sphere. So what happened was, I created a lot of space for myself and I thought, oh, wow, it's interesting. What should I do now? And I thought, hey, my aim ultimately, whether it is through my shoes, my art, my leadership, I want to impact lives. So I went on and started teaching, doing training, corporate training, and I started coaching people where people will pay me and I'll spend like a couple of times a year with them and speak into their lives. So so when I do the coaching, what I did was because for the last whew, 30 years, I've been dealing with people and I've been handling relationship issues, team issues, frustration with the team. So I thought, hey, maybe I can bring this out to help others who are maybe not directly linked to the church. So that's when I started a coaching program where they are leading a team, maybe 10 people, 50 people, and they will bring all these questions about this person, that person. And because I have seen so many of those issues, so when I when I ask them, is this happening right now? Is this the pattern that you're seeing? They, they get freaked out. They are like, oh man, are you a psychic pastor, coach, mentor guy? Like, how do you know all these things? <clears throat> so I say, you know what? Uh, I wish I'm a psychic, but I'm not. And I just know this because I have met so many people. I've been through so many of these issues that the patterns are the same. And because I recognize the pattern, I really want to help you in teams and in building a team in your leadership journey. But, but Nicholas, the thing that is not nice about mentoring or coaching is that all these are considered soft skills. And uh, people are not so willing to pay to learn soft skills. But soft skills are hard. And you can't learn them from a book. Like, all right, if, you know, scenario number 59, your team member is struggling with another team member, what should you do? No, you don't. Those are lessons that you picked up from life, from, you know, just working with people. So that's the second thing I did. I, I do have an, my art space where I paint, I create art. Uh, it's my downtime. It's my time to pray, to be alone, to recalibrate my thoughts so that I can have more teaching materials. So I paint. Uh, yeah, I have a fashion brand, but it's not uh, picking up speed as I like, but it's okay. Uh, that's taking a bit of backseat right now. So mainly church coaching and painting. You, you talked about that oftentimes you know what people are going through based on their team size because of what you've experienced. 
what are the core things that that you see come up often that you deal with all the time and what's some of the solutions that you bring to them and and I like how you said you have to play basketball anyone who watches basketball can tell people you should have put your elbow in or you should have went right instead of left right it's yep. easy to talk about it it's another thing to put in the repetition to understand yeah. what it's like to be in the game situation. So I like That's how right. you put that. There may be other people that have read a book so they can give the answer, but implementing an answer is far more difficult than knowing what the answer is. So the fact that mm -hmm. you've been able to kind of go the opposite, you went through the issues and had to figure out the answers and then the information probably just confirms what you already experienced. But what are the yeah. core things that you see people struggle with and and what's usually the small solutions that, that some of these people can actually implement as well? Okay, I think, I think firstly, the most difficult it's when we do not understand the motive and the reason why someone says something. For example, right, I, I have a team member who, who every time I want to share a new dream, new project for the church or whatever it is, a mission, he will ask me like a million questions. How about this? How about that? How about this? How about that? And in the beginning, before I, I was better equipped and trained, it's frustrating because I'm like, if you don't believe in what I want to do, just get out of my office, right? Like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. But then, but that's not his intention. His motive is not because he doesn't trust me or he doesn't trust the project. Um, as a, a, a person, he's just a natural thinker. He just think about these things. And uh, it, it's not just with what I want to do, even if, with his own life. He, he will think about all these issues. He will just, you know, process them through. So he is just naturally bringing all this thing up to me because it is the way he functions, right? Now, if I do not understand that, I get very frustrated. In fact, I got very frustrated because I didn't know where he was coming from. But when I finally understood, oh, actually, that was his intention. So now, every time he asks me questions, I recognize that, oh, yes, you know what? That's good. I didn't think about that. But since you thought about it, why don't you help me think if I've missed out anything else? And it excites him because he recognize, he now realized that, wow, I actually have a value in my team instead of being shut down all the time. So wow. I don't think, I don't think in team situation, we are as a leader, as, especially us as a leader, our job is not to understand how complicated people are, but our job is to make sure the communication and the conversation that we can have with each other becomes as simple as possible. We don't want to simplify the people. We want to simplify the conversation. If everybody understands that, then we don't have a lot of misunderstanding. If there is no gap in that, then we will function better and we will get to our goal faster. So, so it's really that's good. What, and each person, yeah. each person then helps and contributes as well. That person seemed to be maybe very attention to detail. They want to know all the details before they get started. Yep. Knowing your your strengths in even the artistic side, I'm assuming you you see the picture being done, and you don't really care about all the little details of exactly That's how right. we get there. It's just, uh -huh. and and I get I I'm similar in that way. So I, I could see how that would then help you and help communicate to the team members exactly what they could be doing every day. And yes, uh, yes. speaking of team member, check this out. He wants to say hi. Hi. King Kingston just had to say hello. Remember Pastor hey, Kevin? Man. Hi. Do you remember hi. me? <laughs> you came to my house. <laughs> You're on this little screen over here as well. <clears throat> he's cool. the, he's the mascot of the of the of the team. Yeah, awesome. I, I think that what you said there is is absolutely phenomenal. The one uh -huh. thing that I wanted to, the last question that I had was around your church. We drove pretty far to get there and pretty much everyone that I knew in Malaysia went to your church for the most part. <laughs> and they had to probably drive different areas as well. It's, it's either one because it's just that amazing, which it is. If people haven't experienced it, they should go over. But secondly, it's also because I don't know how many options there are. In the U.S., there's so many options. Church is a momentum thing. It, it's easy to be surrounded by people that believe the same things as you to kind of sharpen your belief all of the time. And when I went over there, I felt this feeling of, wow, 
what is it like if they don't have quite as much of that, right? The yeah. even even inside of the the culture, it's not a ninety percent Christian country. How do you guys stay in momentum with your beliefs, your your relationship with God, your uh, sharpness to just just bring heaven on earth w- when it feels like, and I may be wrong, it feels like you guys are have a big mission in a place with lots of opposition is, is the way that I would put it. Mm-hmm. How are you staying sharp and developed and doing a great job there? Because I, I feel that that's a very difficult thing. I don't know if I could do it at, at this point in my life, be in an environment like that. Right. I would just, I would need to develop even more. How have you guys done it? I think I think over the years, Nicholas, what what really happened was we we grew up as uh, you know a bunch of college kids with nothing. We had you know we we really just arm ourselves with a dream and a vision to bring change to our nation spiritually. And uh, over the years, we have experienced God so much, and God is so tangible. From you know, from a bunch of university students, Nicholas is crazy, to to actually buying our own property, and in fact, this weekend we are celebrating twenty two years as a church. Um, nobody, I mean, when I say nobody, it includes me. If I were to look at myself twenty two years ago, I would not put money on this guy that he will make it. But but, and we didn't know a lot of stuff. I I don't claim that we we had it all figured out. But each step of the way, God became so real. Like, how did we get the building? How did we get this done? And and the team just constantly experiencing God in a very, very tangible manner. And the word that we read each Sunday just becomes true in our lives. And, And I think that part is really, really hard as a pastor. Because if you want to build a business... You just get your sales going, your marketing, your management, you know, your 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 back end, your front end, pretty much. If you make sure you take care of all those things well, then you're done, right? But church, I have no sales speech. I have no targets for the people. But God just became so real and so tangible. People would just come. Their lives would be touched by God. And I just want to make sure that I'll just stay pure in wanting to experience God. If I want to experience God and I'm a human, I'm sure others would want the same. And as long as I get all the leaders to keep that hunger pure, I believe we will just keep going, doing what God has called us to do. Yeah. And 22 years is very impressive. How does someone stay consistent in something and stay fresh in a vision for 22 years? I, I struggle with the... I, you know, five years is difficult to keep one thing going. How, Mm -hmm. how 22 years? And then also on the physical side, how do you stay fresh in that? I'm sure at the beginning, there's all these excitement. You're seeing the growth. 22 years, you have to bring in consistency, commitment. Some of those feelings may not always be there. What, what makes you still show up, especially as a creative that probably loves changing things up all the time? Yep. Um, okay. Uh, Wow. I, I firstly I just put it out there. I I'm not excited the whole time, right? I in the last twenty two years there were days, there were months and long periods of time that just I just thought maybe I should just stop doing this and you know, pass it on to somebody else because I guess to have another young guy more excited than me, that will be way better for the church. But uh and and I want to tell you, right, like for the last 22 years, the audiences, some of them, they are the same people, right? So I can speak with the same content, the same material and the same jokes. They will be like, oh, Pastor, we heard it like a million times already. And every year, I just feel like I don't have it in me anymore to go on for another year. And it is every time in those times that I get like a revelation of this is what you can teach the church. And I am amazed. I am honestly amazed because I know for sure that's not from me. Like one year, uh, I just have this big revelation. God just put this in my heart that the theme for the coming year is slow. And then, and then it's like, hang on, no way. Like 
why slow, right? Everyone's moving so fast. If, if you tell a business guy, you have to go slow in 2024, they are not going to be very impressed, right? But, but what I received that year was slow, not in doing things slowly, but focusing on that which takes time to grow. So I'm not asking them to walk slowly, talk slowly, get your job done slowly, no. But do not neglect stuff that takes time to grow, like your character, your, you know, your personality traits. Those are the things that take time. And don't just focus on your exterior work results, but focus on your internal world. Because if your internal world is strong, it doesn't matter what changes in the future, you'll be able to respond way better. And, and I, it's not from me, definitely not from me. And I felt every time I feel like maybe time's up, I have this and I think it's a sign for me to just keep going. So yeah, but on the other hand, yes, I changed things up all the time in the church, but I keep the fundamentals the same and because I get bored all the time. So I just tweak different things here and there. Not too much because I guess it will scare a lot of people. So yeah, that's how I Such survive. a good answer. And I love, even Jesus wouldn't say things that people would have advised him to say. You don't go to a rich guy that says, I want to follow you. And the first thing you talk to him about is, well, just sell everything you have. That's also not very popular to the rich guy or the successful person either. Yet, if it was a part of God's, what he felt like he was supposed to say, then uh -huh. there's this confidence that you know that it's going to work out. Even with slow, that would not be good for logically a business owner, successful, goal-oriented person. Mm -hmm. Yet when you actually study sports or success, one of the things that's commonly mm -hmm. talked about is if someone's making a lot of mistakes, they would say something like, things are just happening really fast for him right now. Because actually the equipped entrepreneur or sports athlete the things they could be doing things a lot faster, but to them, it's happening in slow motion. Nothing is yeah. shocking them. It's all slow to them, but, but that equaling fast. And so even when I'm listening, I'm going, it's the path I mean, that that's the way is enough activity, lots of activity, more thoughtful. Let's get the yeah. foundation right. And then you end up being a lot faster and, and making a lot less mistakes as well. So I, I, and I just love the fact that you were able to speak that and not go, okay, God, I get you're saying slow. This is how my people want to hear it. I know my people better than you do, which we obviously yeah. know is not true. And you still are able to speak it just as, as Jesus spoke to that person. Uh -huh. And knew that this this is what needs to be said, not, hey, yeah, come on over. Maybe you can help us get a better chariot to go to the next city. That wasn't the <laughs> conversation. And I, just, I love that. that. That's where I'm trying to get to is right. not shutting down what we feel like God's saying or what he said. Mostly just what does that's he right. talk about? And if he talks yeah. about it, I'm going to be okay talking about it. Whereas before, I'd kind of try to man manage everything and, and not do it. So. Thank you so much, Pastor Kevin. I know that for you, it's it's past 10 p.m. for you. No problem. Uh, any final thoughts? I would love to hear, but I just am honored to have you on the show and, and kind of walk through your whole life journey and probe down areas that maybe people haven't asked or talked about before, but it was very insightful for me. Yeah, uh, really, thank you so much for having me. And I think and I think after being, I've been doing this for so long in my life right now to just be able to see you and your family when you came over and to have this friendship. And I think that is the most precious thing for me because we will never know how far this will go and what we will do. And if nothing else happened and we just have this friendship, I'm happy. I, I am more than grateful. But, you know, if the, in days to come, we get to do something together, that will be a bonus. And I want to say to everyone who's listening to us tonight, you don't know who comes into your life. And the Bible tells us even strangers because you might actually entertain angels. So, so yeah, be, be alert, be sensitive to the people that come around your life. Some maybe will help you and some maybe it's meant for you to help them. So yeah, that's, that will be my final thoughts before we go. So good. I'm grateful for you. For people that go to Instagram.com, it's Kev Rick Seven K E V R I C Seven. He's also lead pastor. That it's at Collective Central. Uh, I see that you have aleader.co as well. But from all those things, they can go to even Kevin Lou Paints, which you'll be able to see if you just go to his original Instagram. All those things are linked up in his bio, and, and you connect with them there. 
I just appreciate appreciate you again. This was very fun. Thank you so much for having me, man. Thank you.